It's been so wonderful to see so many of you and just to see um, hugs and smiles. You can see my smile without my mask on. Um, yesterday was, was really special, um, just a great time of fellowship together. Um, for those of us that were volunteering at the clinic, I don't know, it was kind of a little party too. It was really fun, um, just fun to visit, catch up, and, and be together. And I feel so honored to be here today with all of you um, and just blessed by our church family. I have a scripture I want to read to start us off and to get us ready for some praise time. Isaiah 12, um, starting at verse 4. Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion. For great is the Holy One of Israel among you. Our God is great. And we are honored to be able to be here together to praise his name. To hear voices singing together um, is, is a rich blessing. Uh, will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for being in your presence, um, for you loving us so unconditionally and so beautifully in our brokenness, in our fears, in our joys, and how you made our church a family. And we are honored um, to come together to praise your name today. May we lift you up with song, with our voices, um, with the time we are going to be learning together. All for your glory, Lord, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Old things have passed away. Your love has stayed the same. Your constant grace remains the cornerstone. that we thought were dead are breathing in life again you cause your sun to shine on darkest nights for all that you've done we will pour out our love this will be song in Jesus we love you oh how we love you you are the one our hearts adore this
So it's good to see you. How many know if it's good to be seen? You better say amen. 
It's good to be seen. To those of you who are joining us on YouTube Live, God bless you. It's good to kind of see you. We're glad for all of you, for each of you. In a moment, we're going to celebrate communion together. And if you are at home and you have access to some kind of eatery and drinkery, is that scriptural? I'm not sure of those terms. Would you grab those if you'd like to join us in communion? We've got communion kits that are all around the room behind you and to your left and to your right. And in a few moments, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to just start going to the tables to grab one of these communion kits. There's a little cellophane that's on the top. That if you peel that off gently, there will be a little bit of a, a cracker that you can take and remember Jesus' broken body as you eat it. I've used these before. If you snatch it up, your cracker is going to go flying into the atmosphere. But that's all right. Just find it and pick it up and you and God together, it'll be all right. And then the second layer you peel it, and that will give you access to the grape juice. And what we want to do is we want to remember Jesus. See, this bread and this grape juice or wine, whatever you're going to be drinking this morning at your home, these are memorials. It's a memorial. And I want us to make sure that we don't elevate the bread and the juice above what is paramount, and that is Jesus. That the bread should remind you that we did not have the ability to take care of our own sin. It required a perfect sacrifice. And how many of you know that perfect sacrifice isn't anybody in this room today. And so we eat the bread and we drink this juice and we are reminded there was one who was a perfect sacrifice. And he died and he shed his blood. He went to a cross and he did it for you. Did it for me. And I'm great, grateful that he did it. Uh, there's a, a song that says, I don't know why Jesus loved me. I don't know why he cared. I, I got the black preacher suit on, so I feel like preaching already. <laughs> I don't know why he sacrificed his life, but oh, I'm glad. So glad he did. I'm going to give you an opportunity to remember him. To remember Jesus. And I'm excited to do it with you in this room together. Hey, as you go to the table, just make sure that we're aware of all of the protocols and temperaments and all of those kinds of things. But make the focus be on remembering Jesus. Go grab a communion kit. Maybe in your family unit or in the, the bubble that you're comfortable in, maybe find a place in the room. Let's use the room to remember Jesus. Let's pray. Thank you for the bread. We thank you for the fruit of the vine. Whether in this room or at home, would you join in with us, Holy Father? Would you commune with us? Some of us know one another. We've been hanging out together for a while. Others came today for the first time. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy and your provision and your providence. Would you instill in every single man, woman, boy, and girl, 
that have confessed the name of Jesus Christ, that they desire him to be Lord of their life, would you instill in them confidence to spend this next season going to the table, grabbing one of these communion kits, and can we just make it all about you? No one else. Nothing else. Father, help us to not make time that is uh, for remembering you a time to hurry up and get past it. Help us to acknowledge that you have done everything for us. I'm so grateful. So it's going to be a while. We're going to spend just celebrating and remembering. But Holy Spirit, would you make your presence ever so known as we go to the tables now, as we grab our items at home, wherever we are, so that we can remember Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. and start going to the tables.
How many of you can give God praise for Tessa Vanderkamp leading us in worship? And this morning, Tessa is joined by her friend from school, Caleb. Caleb, thank you for being here this morning, brother. You are welcome anytime. And I'm going to remind you of that several times in the weeks to come <laughs> in a positive way. Again, it is so grateful to have all of you here. Uh, if you call yourself a member or you're connected at Common Ground, maybe uh, there's somebody here, you know their name and they know your name. And you know something about their story and they know something about your story. And, and you've served together to help somebody else. And because of those three things, you're connected. I'm so glad that you're here. And perhaps that describes someone who is joining us online and so, so thankful that you would click on that link and join us this morning. Again, perhaps you consider yourself a guest, and if you consider yourself a guest, thank you for being here. Common Ground, can we welcome our guests this morning in Jesus' name? I remember back in the day when we lovingly and awkwardly embarrassed guests at church, you know. There's nothing quite like a room filled with 60 people and four of them have a big old strawberry, you know, attached to them to let everybody know, ah, fresh meat. We're not going to do that, all right. Yeah, we're not going to do any of that. Uh, uh, we're not going to send the Asian guests to the Asian elder, you know, we're, we're not going to do none of that. <laughs> oh, y'all have never experienced that? I have. Yeah, we're not going to do any of that. But what we are going to do is we're going to say thank you for being here and welcome to Common Ground. Uh, I couldn't help but uh, shed a few tears during uh, our Lord's Supper today. It just feels good to be in the room. Yeah, it feels good to be in the room. So, Ramel, help me out. Um, am I in a good place? Because we're doing the camera thing and the lighting thing. I'm in a good place. All right. Um, I appreciate Ramel uh, helping the, yes. I so am grateful for Carrie and for the ministry that he has done. Y'all keep the clapping going because it has just been so just thankful. Chris, to you, Chris Carlson, our sound engineer, I'm just so grateful. And Ramel's family, Tammy and Marcus, so grateful. So grateful. Marcus, Marcus he's, the, he's the one that's really holding down the show, you know. And Ruth, thank you for being here this morning and helping the tech team. Always good to see you, dear. This morning we're going to be in the Hebrew Scriptures. Open your Bibles to the book of Joshua. Bring it on up. Um, let's release our kids to kids' worship. Thank you for flagging me down. I appreciate that. If you have a child that is in the fifth grade or younger and you are comfortable with them being around other kids, masked up, and having the time of their lives, then now is the time to release them. Oh, see, they didn't move until I said that. Then they just jumped up. See, it's all about presentation. All right? 
Uh, we'll take them for a season and we'll bring them back where? Where will we bring them back? So in the main lobby, we'll bring them back after our gathering is over and so you can find them there. Joshua chapter 4. This is a stone, little smooth stone, and it has a heart on it. You know, it really only takes one single stone. Uh, it has the ability, believe it or not, to transport a whole generation to a moment in time. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, and it doesn't matter what time you're living in or where you're at or what you're experiencing. All it takes is one stone. And it can remind you, it can transport you, it can release you from where you are and take you someplace else. If the stone is a memorial, this is a Memorial Day weekend. And this was established uh, by the Congress of the United States in 1971 as a, a day specifically tomorrow, the last Monday in May, to remember and to mourn those who have given their lives literally in service of our country and the armed forces. And so Memorial Day is connected to people who have died. Veterans Day acknowledges those who have been in armed services. And traditionally, we also do that on Memorial Day as well. We certainly are very, very grateful for those who have served in our country. If you are comfortable and you have served in this country, if you would stand right now, and all we want to do is say, yay, God, for who you are. Go ahead and stand up and represent. So grateful. If you're online and you served in our nation, go ahead and indicate that because we want to say yea God to you as well. The word memorial means something, especially a structure established to remind people, remind us of a, a person or an event. Let me do that again. Memorial means something, especially a structure established to remind us of a person or an event. I did not grow up around a lot of military in my family. My uncle was in Korea, and, but he lived in Southern California, and so we didn't hang out with each other a lot. And so growing up, Memorial Day and Memorial Day weekend, uh, as a child, I didn't connect it with the military I connected it with barbecue. Come on now. I am not the only one in the room. I connected it to great weather. I also connected it to Yosemite Bible Camp. Yosemite Bible Camp every year did a fundraiser on Memorial Day weekend, and we would go uh, up to uh, Oakhurst, uh, in the Yosemite Valley area, just, just west of it, actually. And every year they would take a whole cow, a dead one, and they would bury this thing for 24 hours so that when they dug it up, it was ready for eating. And so I, I connected Memorial Day weekend with, all right, we're going to get our, our, our barbecue on. I have loved dead animals ever since. And I also connected it to school is about to be over. Yeah, that's what I connected it to. And in other words, I took Memorial Day and I kind of generalized it. You know, I, I, I didn't make it specifically about one thing, what it was designed for. Uh, but I generalized it as an opportunity to just make memories, it's to spend time with my friends and my family and, and count my blessings and, well, to eat barbecue. 
Memorials come in all different shapes and sizes and, and, and the structure or the object itself is not what is paramount. What is paramount is the person or the event in which the object is connected to. Recently, uh, I had the privilege of being with uh, my wife and my mother, and we were visiting a bonsai garden up in Federal Way, Washington. We went to see the rhododendron garden and were pleasantly surprised that the Pacific Bonsai Museum was a part of this entire display. It was unbelievably lovely and moving. If you go on their website, it advertises itself as a collection of 150 bonsai that are among the finest examples of bonsai anywhere in the world. Yeah, but really it's a memorial. It was a memorial of resilient Japanese American people whose lives and cultures became at risk during war times and whose history and culture are imprinted within the extraordinary art form of a bonsai. <clears throat> Some of you know that I have a scar on my arm. It's a pretty long scar. And it's a scar because I had a surgery, but the scar is more than a scar. It's connected to an event. It's connected to some people. The event was a benign bone tumor that I had as a, a 12 year old. The people that it's connected to is my mom and dad. Every time I look at this scar in the mirror, I am reminded of how much they loved me. I cannot verbally describe to you the physical pain that I experienced during that time. And I have precious memories of my mom just massaging my arm and icing my arm. And at the time, certainly early on, we didn't know what the problem was. All we knew was that this kid kept saying, it hurts, it hurts. I got to tell you that on this Memorial Day weekend, 2021, it's probably a good idea for you to find a stone. Where's your stone? What have you established as the thing that will remind you, your kids, the community in which you live, how good God has been through the global pandemic, through the social dissonance, the wildfires. Remember the wildfires? Isn't it interesting how the great toilet paper caper just became paramount over the fact that the mountainsides were in flames? Or even a divisive presidential election. What do you have that you can establish not as something to remind you of the global dumpster fire, but something that would remind you that God was good all the way through it? That he never left you. He never forsook you. Even while you were going through the trials and the battles, he was with you. All it takes is one stone. Doesn't have to be anything extraordinary, large, but there needs to be something I'm suggesting to you in a strong way, in a loving pastoral way that you experience doubt oftentimes because you don't have anything to help you remember. 
You remember to, to build your trust in God. Every time you see it, it reminds you, oh yeah, God has never lost a battle. But then you feel doubt and despair and you wonder where God is. You can probably draw attention to the fact that it's been a long time since something brought you back. All it takes is a stone. Let's read from God's word together from Joshua chapter four. Joshua chapter four. It's been a long time, long time since I asked you to stand to your feet as we read God's word, but I wanna do that right now. If it's comfortable for you or convenient for you, let's read together from God's word from Joshua Chapter four, <clears throat> I'll read out loud, you read silently. When all the nation had finished passing over Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, take 12 men from the people, from each tribe a man. Command them saying, take 12 stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly. Bring them over with you and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. <clears throat> and Joshua called the 12 men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, pass on before the ark of the Lord, your God, into the midst of the Jordan and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder. According to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. Have you dropped down <clears throat> to verse 21, uh, 21. And he said to the people of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know. Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, <clears throat> which he dried up for us until we passed over so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Again, verse 24, why do you answer this question to your children? Oh, what, what do these stones mean? Why, why do you answer the question? Well, it reminds us when God dried up the water of Jordan, just like he did at the Red Sea. Why, why do you do that? Verse 24, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Oh, God bless you, everybody. You may be seated. You may be seated. <clears throat> Verse seven says that there was one stone that every tribe should pick up. One stone per tribe to remind them that God kept his promise. Then you te shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. 
I need to remind you that God promised to Israel a land. Oh, it wasn't going to be a land that they were going to rent or lease. It's going to be theirs. Finally, a home, a place to call our own. God made this promise to Israel, and God is on the verge of fulfilling this promise when we get to Joshua, the book of Joshua. Moses, the great leader who God used to bring the people out of the land of Egypt, has now died. Joshua, the young man, is now in charge of millions of hard-headed folks. He's in charge of taking them into the promised land, but before they can get to Canaan, they've got to cross Jordan, the River Jordan. If you can picture the Willamette River, the, the Willamette River flowing between West Portland or the downtown area and the east side of Portland, uh, where the good food is. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> I'm just trying to keep it real. It's Memorial Day weekend. <laughs> if you can picture the Willamette in your mind, the Israelites approach the Willamette from Gresham. And they get to the east banks of the Willamette, Jordan. And Joshua begins to prepare the people to cross the Willamette into the promised land. But before God takes them across Jordan, he tells Joshua, I want you to help the people to remember me, to remember what I have done, to remember who I am, to remember that there was never a time in all of their lives that I was not with them. As a matter of fact, I loved them so much that I went before them. Before they even got to where they were going, I'd already been there and prepared a way. And so Joshua, before you take them across Jordan, I want you to tell the, the people, all 12 tribes, find one man. One man, total of 12, wants you to go into the Willamette. Now, by this time, the Willamette, the waters are, they have separated so that the riverbed is completely dry, just like God did at the Red Sea. I want you to go into this big riverbed and find a rock. And, and notice in the scriptures, that when they found the rock, they put it on their shoulders. Now, unless they did this, which looks ridiculous, they probably had some great big old rocks, big ones, rocks that required some help to pick it up, to put it on their shoulder, this big old rock, it only takes one. You get one, and you get one, and you get one. And then together, these 12 stones, large stones, I want you to use them as a memorial for how long does the text say? That is right, forever. Y'all stay with me, all right? This memorial is forever. As a matter of fact, the scriptures say that Joshua himself found 12 stones. And Joshua took 12 stones and put those stones in the middle of this dry river, set up this memorial. And according to the Hebrew scriptures, it's still there today. Now, why in the world would Joshua make a memorial in the middle of a river, dry riverbed, 
knowing that at some point the water is going to fill up the riverbed. What's up with that? Guess what happens during times of drought? Come on now. Come on now. In times of drought, when the water is low and folk are thirsty and they begin to want to grumble and complain, even in a dry riverbed, they can see the rock. They can see the stones and they can be reminded that even though the riverbed is dry, we serve a God that can fill it up again. Isn't that amazing? The providence of God, the provision of God. So they take these 12 stones and they set them up. And the Bible says, the Hebrew scripture says that Joshua tells the people at some point, your kids are going to ask you, what's up with these stones? That's my translation. What's up with these stones? And the stones become an opportunity for you to give God praise. Because the stone reminds you of that moment when God dried up the river so that you could go into the promised land. He said he would give you the promised land and he kept his promise. Where is your stone? the thing that can help remind you God is a good God. Now this world is kind of jacked up, but God is so very good. He's always been with me. You see, we attribute the idea, the concept of the promised land with the notion of a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm pretty sure that's supposed to be a positive image, though for me, a whole bunch of flowing of milk and honey does not sound very attractive, but that's just me. I did have a kid in my youth group one time try to describe heaven as rolling hills of chocolate. All right. At the time, and still, I don't really like chocolate. So the analogy escaped me. But you get the point that when we think of promised land, we think of, if I can use a 70s term, good times. But the fact of the matter is that the promised land, going into the promised land, meant there was going to be some battles. Do you know the scripture? Do you know the stories that after they got into the promised land, the battles began? The, the, the Canaan wasn't a wide open door. It was a land, it was a region that God had promised them, but there was still going to be some battles. In Numbers chapter 32, the Reubenites uh, and, and the half tribe of Manasseh and and uh, let, me, let, me, let me get it right here because I, I want to make sure that I pronounce it correctly. The Gadites, they asked Moses, look, man, when we get to the, the region just east of the Jordan, can we have it? <laughs> I mean, it's wide open. It's lush. It's like perfect for livestock. And we're livestock people. We love Uh, to have this, would it be okay if we have it? And Moses kind of got hot about that. What do you mean that you mean we get to the edge of Jordan and then after we cross Jordan, we got all these battles, but y'all gonna just chill because you've arrived? I don't think so. And then in Numbers chapter 32, the Rubites and the Gadites and half tribe of Manasseh, they make a promise that when we get to Jordan, 
We'll have our, our, our wives and our, our moms and our kids and our servants and our cattle. We'll have them remain in this section if it's okay with you. And we'll take all of the well-bodied men and we will go before you and alongside you and with you and we will battle with you in this new land and we won't go and settle in the land and be comfortable at home until you and all our brothers and kinfolk have a home to settle and be comforted in. Uh, that's what's being described in the middle of Joshua chapter four. There's battles in the promised land. Uh, I, I hope that when you were taught the gospel for the first time or someone was pastoring you or teaching you, I hope that they didn't paint a picture that to become a Christian means this all good times. Because 2020 was a tough year, was it not? And how many of you know there's been experiences in our lives that were difficult and it wasn't just 2020? And yet, where was God? That's what Jehovah is telling Joshua. Tell the people, remember, all it takes is one stone. All it takes is one stone. We can generalize it. We can generalize going to church and, and being in the body of Christ and being a Christian. We can generalize it as, yes, God is good and so forth and so on. But I'm, I'm bringing to you my pastor's heart today. I, I'm inviting you to be specific. That at some point, for the kids' sake, for the community's sake, for your family and friends' network, for people who you hang out with and they have either no interest in God or maybe they're even skeptical, that there's one specific stone that you could point to and say, let me tell you what God did. Let me tell you how good he is. See, we struggle with doubt and trust in God because we don't have memorials. We don't have a thing, a something, a, a, a rock, a, a bonsai tree, a scar that we could say, let me, let me show you that you, you see this? And then in five minutes, just glorify God. We read the last section of this passage on purpose because it's not just about you. It's not just about me. God was actually having them establish this memorial so that they have an opportunity to tell the whole world how good God is. Again, Verse 21, and he said to the people of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, and they're going to ask, and then my translation, what's up with these rocks? Then you shall let your children know Israel passed over Jordan on dry ground for the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over. And look at him, connect the memorial to Egypt, just like he did the Red Sea, <laughs> which he dried up for us until we passed over. Watch it, verse 24, so that all the peoples of the earth, all of them, believers, unbelievers, skeptics, people who know the scripture, people who don't even know that Joshua was a person, all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty. Two things. Number one, the hand of the Lord is indeed mighty. 
Let me say it again and make that amen a little bit louder, brother. I need your help. The hand of the Lord is indeed mighty. It's mighty. Second thing, you need to remember that. There's going to be times that are going to absolutely suck. And you're going to need something to remind you, oh yeah, God's hand is mighty. Listen to the psalmist. We, we can quote it. We've quoted it, a lot of us, all of our lives. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. That evil is all around and the situation is horrible. So how in the world can your fear be mitigated if I'm reminded that you are with me? That's the key. You answer the question about the rock so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty. How do you know it was mighty? Because look what he did at Red Sea. Look what he did at Jordan. Find what your Red Sea is, what your Jordan is. And, and, and remember, because you need to know the world, the whole world needs your testimony, needs your witness. Christians, we're not witnessing enough. It might be just because in the midst of our own legitimate and real doubt. It's just been a long time since I, I really thought about it. That one time and that other time and when he was with mom and when I prayed and he, and he showed up and then there was that time that I went to him and it was like he didn't do anything and I, but then I, remember that he did that and he was over here and even in the midst of the horror and the dumpster fire, God's hand is mighty. I need to remember that. So do you. So that the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. The lesson is pretty simple. You got to find a stone. Got to find a stone. You need a stone. You and God, you, you, you talk about it. You, you figure it out. Something physical, something tangible, something you can hold on to, something you can visit from time to time. It's, it's important. It's important. You show me a believer in Jesus Christ, filled and overwhelmed with doubt. And I'll show you a believer who doesn't have anything in their life to help them remember. So find a stone, get a stone, something. It don't have to be an actual stone, but something. <sighs> Let us give the world something to see and hear stories how God's hand is mighty. Let's pray. Holy Father, I wonder if you would, by the power of your Holy Spirit, give us several moments to just think about you. Would you bring to our minds in this very moment. Maybe one or two or three moments in time that it was obvious that your hand was in it. I mean, we it's easy for us to remember the pain. It is so easy for us to remember the difficulty. It's legitimate pain. It is legitimate difficulty. It's part of the experience of crossing Jordan. 
but just for the next few moments, maybe remind us of one or two, maybe three moments in time in our lives where your hand showed up in a mighty way. God, I ask that you would increase our our creative juices to take this passage of scripture, this narrative from Joshua chapter four and help us creatively consider a stone. Something that from time to time, when when my kids or when my friend or, or when someone who I'm talking to uh, over Zoom at work, and they notice that thing on my shelf or that, that little plaque on the wall, and they ask, so what's up with that thing or that plaque? And it just opens up an opportunity for me to remember and for me to express to somebody else about your mighty hand. It's been a long year, year and a half, three years, five years, 30 years, whatever it has been for each individual. It's been a long, long journey. Help us to even when the riverbed goes dry to to remember, to see, because... It only takes one stone. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In a moment, we're going to say goodbye to you. And we're going to, by the power of Jesus Christ, release you to the queue. Uh, There's several things that we want you to be praying about and anticipating. Uh, We'll be at Evelyn Schiffler Park, God willing, next Sunday morning. We're going to give you an opportunity to be together, to worship God in the open air. We're going to call it an open air gathering. And we're going to have a community meal. Now, some of you have been around long enough to remember uh, the, the different picnics that we've had where everybody brought their own food. I know my glasses are off, but I can still see a head shake. All right. <clears throat> So we're going, to have, we're going to have that experience. The, the only difference is we won't have the shared table, all right? So we won't be sharing food. Um, you can share food in your bubble, whatever makes you comfortable. Uh, but it's going to just be a time for us to worship and to be together. That's next Sunday, June 6th at Evelyn Schiffler Park. Uh, I need to find like a teenager who I can pay like 10 bucks an hour to go camp out starting at 5 in the morning so that we can, you know, have it. Because Parks and Rec aren't taking reservations. So um, that's next Sunday. Uh, as I hope all of us know, we have discontinued using Zoom for our gatherings. There's uh, quite a few folks that are on YouTube Live this morning. And um, thank you for joining us. Uh, one of them is my brother and my sister-in-law down in Southern California. And uh, for those of you who know that story... It's pretty cool. So, sis, thanks for joining us. I'm assuming that my family in Fresno is continuing to join. And so, hey, um, thanks <laughs> for coming. And Juan, is there any other announcements that I'm supposed to give? Because I'm trying to recall. Oh, Yes. Can we give God praise for 124 people that were vaccinated in this building yesterday? Amazing. Absolutely amazing. On Friday, we had 45 people that were signed up. 45. And yesterday, there were 100 gift bags that were created. And then Nina and her team had to throw together 20 more at the last minute because they ran out. And there were four that didn't get a gift bag. 
in our believe, there were two people that came and we had to reschedule them because they came late. And so God be praised. As a matter of fact, some of you know I'm writing a book. And it was so impactful to me, I'm currently writing a chapter called 124. Pray about that. Come on now. So I personally want to thank, and I invite you to join me in thanking Nina Stafford for organizing that whole thing. Stand to your feet, and we'll uh, dismiss you in Jesus' name. Find a stone. Find a stone. Be a memorial to one another. You hear what I said? Because it's important. It's important. We'll have those times when it feels like we're in a dry and and desolate place. And we just got to remember, truth does not, truth does not change or it is not a Affected because of my circumstance. Yeah. Uh, there's a song that I grew up uh, hearing and singing. You can YouTube it. It's one of them old school black people songs called God Specializes. God, he specializes in things that seem impossible. Uh, tunneling through a mountain, God specializes. Crossing over a, a river that's just tossing and turning and flowing with water. It seems impossible. God specializes in that. It's a good song. Maybe we'll sing it sometime. God bless you. Take care. Bye-bye.